We're in Acts chapter 6 today, talking about the Empowered Church. Series that I've been in, Acts chapter 6, the Empowered Church. And today I've uh, entitled the message, Problem Solved, But Attacks Continue. Sounds kind of interesting. Problem Solved, But Attacks Continue. Today when we uh, we talk about uh, solving problems, it's uh, very interesting about how problems get solved. And sometimes in, in the world's way of solving problems, they can solve it. And even though the problem's solved, people are still mad. They're, they're, still, they're still not satisfied. But when God solves a problem, he brings unity to that which could be disunity. He, he brings people together and forms them in a way that actually brings blessing and grows the church. So that's an amazing way to think. And today we're going to look at the way that God solves problems. And he did it in the early church, and he can do it today because we certainly do need a problem solver with the many things that are happening, not only in our lives, but also in the world today. Uh, God designed his church to be able to solve problems, and we're going to uh, look at how that, that uh, happened today. Um, I think that uh, one of the, the biggest things that we deal with is, is just um, not really involving God in the problems. Uh, I was... Uh, reminded that uh, a leadership principle that I grew up with is you have to set goals and meet goals. And uh, I've always carried that with me, but I'm not necessarily one of those guys that sets goals. I actually like to solve problems. And so recently I was really affirmed in that because discovered that in business today, most CEOs are problem solvers, not goal setters. In fact, they say that successful companies actually solve problems they don't set goals and I was like set free I was like wow all right I'm in and so today you know people talk about setting goals but the reality is that you don't meet a goal unless you solve a problem (laughs) because if you could already meet that goal then you would need to set it but you set goals because it's to achieve something that you haven't achieved yet And usually there's barriers in the way in order to get there. And so if you're not a problem solver, just a goal setter, you probably won't meet your goal. But the church was a problem solver, and we're going to see that today. Well, let's let's dive in and see how they solved the problem in the first part of chapter 6. And then the latter part of chapter 6, we're going to see how the attacks continued on the church. So let's start in verse 1. In those days... When the number of disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. And we will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, and Procasius, Nakender, Timon, Prominius, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And they presented these men to the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples of Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a number of priests became obedient to the faith. So let's look at solving problems God's way. There was an issue that came up. Some were starving, and some were overeating. That was the problem. That was the complaint. But oftentimes the complaint is not the problem. The complaint is our problem, but that's not the problem that has to be fixed. But oftentimes a complaint comes up, and we have to recognize the complaint is not the problem. The problem was there was a systems breakdown. There was something that was not being distributed properly and adequately. I don't know that anybody intended it that way. It's just that the number of people grew so quickly that the systems they had in place In order to provide for the widows, the church was taking responsibility for the widows that didn't have means. And so in order to do that, they needed to then expand or revise their systems. 
Last week, or the week before that in our staff meeting, I got wind that we might be baptizing up to 12 people at the end of this service. Many of you probably experienced that last Sunday. I watched it online. And so we right away realized that the system that we had in place normally baptizing two, three, or four would not be adequate to baptize 12. And so we talked through as a staff, how are we going to administrate efficiently and meaningfully 12 people within a certain period of time because we can't do it the way we've done it before. We've got to change the system. And praise God, we got an amazing staff. They did it. They baptized 11 people in 12 minutes. I watched the video. So kudos to the staff and team. It was exciting. But it just goes to show that when you expand the numbers of people in situations, then you have to look at your systems. And they can be old and antiquated, and you got to update, and you got to look at where are we going in order to expand and grow. And this is really what happened in the, uh, the early church. They uh, needed to uh, examine this and be prepared for it. So how did they do it? Well, the first thing they did, and I'm going to give you five steps here of how they identified the problem and fixed it. And these five steps that I'm going to give you will work for you in whatever life situation that you're in. Whether, you're, whether your marriage is breaking down, whether your relationships are, are out of order, whether you've got a problem at work, maybe you've got a, a team that you're leading that, that something isn't working. If you, if you implement and look at these five steps, they will work for you. So let's dive in and see how they did it. First of all, they identified the problem. And the problem we see surfacing is in chapter 1 where the food was not being distributed adequately. And you have two different uh, groups of the widows here. You have, they call the Hellenistic Jews, which are really Greek-speaking, Greek culture Jews. They were the ones that came up from the Greek culture. And then you have the Hebraic Jews, which obviously came up from a Jewish culture. Now, those two cultures didn't necessarily like each other, or they were suspect. The, 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 the uh, Hebraic Jews, they thought they were holier than the, than the, the Greek uh, Jews, the widows. And the, the, the uh, Greek widows, they thought they were more free than the Jewish widows that, again, were tied up in all the law. So you had this kind of contention going on because of their culture. But the thing they had in common is they were both followers of Jesus. And that's important to understand. They were both followers of Jesus. And so they did have that in common as they uh, uh, were going to, again, solve this problem. So you have to identify the problem. It is a systems problem that needs to be fixed. And in order to do that, there needs to be oversight that they didn't have before. I don't know how they did it before. Everybody just showed up in a room and, 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 and just, you know, when the food ran out, it ran out. And they didn't, they didn't think about... Uh, um, maybe uh, people needed to be served rather than serve themselves. And people were, you know, front of the line, they were walking away with big plates of food in the back of the line. They were just getting uh, one French fries or something. I mean, I don't know what it was, but obviously it says one were starving and the other was being fed. So it was a systems problem that they had to work out. And uh, so they identified the problem. The second thing is to determine the best solution. Now, when you uh, start determining what is the best solution, when you start identifying what brings hope to somebody, you recognize that you are actually half ways to solving the problem when you bring hope to somebody. Wanda and I were recently with a, a leader, and, and uh, they felt like they had no hope. They, they felt trapped. They felt discouraged. They felt like there was no way out of their circumstances. And so we listened, and we heard, and we empathized, and, and then uh, about halfway through the conversation, I asked this question, what would bring you hope? And initially, they didn't know. They were just like fogged over, just like, I, I don't know, I don't know. And so we begin, to, we begin to probe a little bit of what kind of things would bring them hope. And then suddenly there was a spark. It was like, oh, yes. That would bring me hope. And I knew, even though nothing's changed, so to speak, we've identified something that sparked hope. And as a result of that, then I recognize that we can work through this problem when the person has a spark of hope. So if you're working through something, pay attention to where you gain hope. Now, the enemy wants to lie to us. 
and say there is no hope. There, there's no hope available. There's no hope on the way. God doesn't care about you anymore. Nobody cares about you. Just, you know, end it all or forget it all. That's not how God thinks. That's not how the early church thought. So they identified the problem, systems problem. They started wading into solutions that sparked hope among those that needed the problem solved. Well, what exactly did they do? So the 12, first of all, the 12 recognized there was a problem. This was coming from the ground up rather than the top down. And they recognized there was a problem that needed to happen. And so they said in verse 3, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you that are known to be full of wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them, verse 4, and we will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. So the next thing they did in solving this problem is they took action to bring, bring the best results. Now, there are three things that are, that are connected to this taking action. First of all, they clarified their own responsibility. The apostles clarified their own responsibility of what they need to do. You know, if you want to solve a problem, you need to take it up. You can't take it around and you can't spread it down. That won't solve the problem. You have to take it up. You have to take it up to someone that has the ability or has the authority to see into and make changes in order to solve the problem. And ultimately in the church, we take problems all the way up to the top. We pray about it. The sooner you can pray about a problem, the sooner you'll find hope, and the sooner you'll begin to understand some possibilities that you didn't see before. If you take it up to the headmaster, Jesus himself, and say, help me solve this problem. The more that you lag in taking it to that dimension, the more that you'll be clouded in thinking there is no hope and the problem can't be solved. And I've seen this over and over again. If I have challenges with a leader or people, I find that the sooner that I pray with them, the sooner it gets solved. And, the, and, and if they won't pray with me or we don't get a chance to pray together, then oftentimes it doesn't get solved and we end up having a breach in relationship. That's the difference, whether or not we take it up. Now, sometimes you can ask around those around you to maybe get clarity, but the moment you take it down to involve people that are not involved, that's called gossip. And you are heading towards division and, and, and divide, and you, you are heading, you take it down, that's gossip. That will absolutely destroy anything that you're trying to do. And that's what the world teaches us to do all the time. Don't take it up. Spread it around and take it down. That's what the world wants to do because the enemy's behind the world systems to try to get us to break up. But God wants us to come together and operate in, in unity. That's what his desire is. And we have to understand how the enemy thinks, the world thinks, and then how God thinks and cooperate with him instead of how the world would do that. Clarify responsibility. The apostles said that our ministry is teaching the word and prayer. Now, it, it, don't misunderstand me. It wasn't that the apostles couldn't wait tables. It's that they recognized other people could do that job and, and, and raise up to leadership. And that's what they were promoting. This is really the, the first that we begin to see a gift-based ministry emerge in the church. That they recognized people in that group had giftings that, that they didn't need to step in to begin to wait tables. Now, what does it mean to wait tables? It doesn't mean to uh, put food on or to cook in the kitchen. That's not what it's talking about. Actually, the term waiting tables is a term that was used to describe a, a financial transaction or even directing or distributing what is needed. So it was really a leadership position of waiting tables, not just necessarily a servant position of just putting food on the table or making sure that everyone had what they needed. It was a leadership oversight kind of position. And the apostles recognized that there were other people that could do that equally as well as they could, even though they could have stepped in and done it. I mean, it's like the idea that the pastor needs to show up at every meeting that the church has. I mean, if I would do that, I'd be in a hospital right now. I'd be like, oh, on life support. But yet I recognize that there's very many capable, there's very, uh, there's a lot of capable people in the church that have abilities 
that are equal to or maybe even better than what I have. And so those, those are delegated to them. The responsibility is delegated to them and the authority is delegated to them in order for uh, the church to grow and to incorporate more people. And I, I honor that. I recognize that's what we're all about here at Crossroads. It's not about the pastor showing up at every, every place and every time. I have a friend of mine that pastors a church and, and he was taking care of a family emergency and just uh, missed a, a, a men's gathering that the church had planned. And one of the elders railed him out after the end, said, where were you? And just came down on him really harshly because he had missed the meeting. He didn't even care about the fact he was taking care of a family emergency, just that he missed the meeting. I mean, that's just like, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, even, even uh, this weekend, Wanda's good friend, best friend, she was a part of our, our, our wedding in, uh, in, uh, in Wanda's side, not my side. <laughs> and uh, she... She said that the pastor invited her and several others in to pray for the needs of the church. But she said she doesn't understand that when the pastor can't be there, he cancels the prayer meeting. And I was like, that's odd. Why would he do that? Apparently, you think that the people can't pray right unless he's there. I mean, it's a mentality that pastors can have, and I think that's just terrible. That you raise people up, put them in places, and set them free to do what God has called them to do. And that's how we attempt and try to function here at uh, Crossroads. They also listed the qualifications. They were very simple, very few. He says, I want you to find seven men among you that are full of the Spirit and wisdom. Those were the only two qualifications that were needed. Full of the Holy Spirit, because when we're full of the Holy Spirit, that means we have access to the mind of Christ, that we can, uh, again, pray and seek and determine what is right and what is needed, and wisdom. And wisdom means that they are very practical-minded as well as spiritually-minded. So it's the combination of the two that they were looking for in these leaders to pull up to be able to uh, administrate and, and design this new system that was needed in order to bring unity and to uh, be able to then uh, bring harmony to the church. The other thing they did I thought was clever is they involved those that were affected. In other words, they didn't just uh, uh, put an ad on Facebook, hey, we need some deacons for the church, or an ad in the newspaper. No, they actually went among those that needed leaders and said, they're among you, find them. And I think that was very wise because they were probably already in relationship with these seven guys that they had. And incidentally, three of the names, the first three listed are Greek names. They're not Hebrew names. And so uh, they already were starting to mix things up in a sense of the leaders were also a part of different, the different groups. So they pulled them together and, and uh, they, they weren't just uh, all Hebrew leaders or all Greek leaders. There was a mixture of those. But again, they said that the, the, you that are being affected, they're among you. So find them, raise them up. Now, it wasn't just a, a great campaign that, you know, set them up for a vote, and whoever won the vote, the campaign, ran a good campaign, got the votes and won. It, it wasn't that way either, because it, the apostle says, now, once you choose the seven, bring them back to us, and we're going to pray and seek God that they're right, and then we're going to lay hands on them, because they are an extension of the twelve. And, and we, we see that as well. well. I mean, we see like the worship team is an extension of the elder team. We see, we see uh, life group leaders is an extension of pastoral care. It's not about the staff. It's about, that's about people that God has raised up to do what they do. And they're an extension. They have, they have a responsibility, yet they have the authority to minister to people as equal as we do. And that's how the church operates, and that's how we desire to operate as well. And that's what they did. They, they released their authority uh, to carry out the role. I was with Mitchell yesterday. We were talking, and Mitchell made this comment. I thought it was worthy to uh, say it publicly today. He says, good leaders release responsibility. Great leaders release authority. Good leaders release responsibility, and then they micromanage you. Great leaders release authority. You have the responsibility and authority to do as God shows you. Let's stay connected. If something happens, let's see what God is doing. Let's be in unity together. But you have the authority to do. And so that's what they did. They had apostolic affirmation. 
And then here we have the problem solved. What did the problem, when the problem got solved, what happened? There was peace. There was harmony. Growth happened. We see in verse 7, it says that they, uh, they, um, the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. <laughs> That's amazing. Having a preacher that didn't know Jesus. Yeah, it was going on. I've heard of that happening. In fact, I, I remember a guy sharing his testimony when he first started pastoring. He didn't know Jesus. And later on in his pastoring, he became saved. Glory to that congregation. Seems odd to us, but it does happen. So Jewish priests, maybe they saw all this happen and they thought, wow, I want to know Jesus too. I went in on this. But something happened. It says that even Jewish priests became saved and started following Jesus. There could have been a potential split at this point in the church. It's possible. But yet they jumped in through the power of the Holy Spirit and began to solve it God's way and as a result brought unity and growth. What did they do? They identified the problem. They stopped complaining and they said, what is the actual problem? Number two, they determined the best solution that brought hope. That brought hope to the people. They acknowledged the leadership was trusted. They, number three, they took action to bring about the best results. They had qualifications, and those qualifications were met, and they accepted the call. Number four, they released authority over those to choose to carry out their roles so that the 12 apostles weren't stretched beyond what God had called them to be, and everybody remained in good mental health. Number five, when the problem was solved, growth in the church happened and people were edified and blessed. So these five principles work. You can apply them in any given situation and they will work out because there's God's way of solving problems. Now you think, wow, problem solved. We can breathe easy and take a vacation, right? No. Suddenly the attack continues. Because we recognize that the attacks of the church on the church had been taking place ever since the birth. I mean, the apostles were preaching, and the Sanhedrin's raised up and said, well, you can preach, but not in the name of Jesus. And then they were put in jail. And then, and then the, uh, God came in, and, and Ananias and Sapphira were lying uh, to the Holy Spirit about a price of land, and they dropped dead. I mean, God corrected his church. I mean, all kinds of things that were going on that, that were, were like, wow. And now we get to the place where, again, the church could have split. It came back together. The enemy's like, I can't win. And so now I'm going to pick on Stephen. Stephen is the first one mentioned here as one of the, one of the deacons. And we see Stephen as uh, someone that obviously was not good at practical measures of figuring out systems and getting them working. He was a powerful preacher. And God was working through him with signs, wonders, and miracles. We see that starting out here. Let me just uh, read this section of verses, and then, then we'll look at what the Lord is showing us through it. Verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition, however, arose from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandra, as well as the providence of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom of the Spirit, uh, the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly, secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law, and they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who, wit who testified, This fellow never stops speaking against the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw his face shine like the face of an angel. Wow. What an amazing moment. Stephen is the first one to be named doing signs, wonders, and miracles outside of the 12 apostles. 
And it just grew from there. So God was demonstrating the fact that it was not just about the 12 anymore. It was about his body, those that he's chosen, leaders that rise up, that are gifted, and he's called, and he chose Stephen, and Stephen stepped into that calling as well. And we have that beginning to happen. And really, the attack, what was it about? It was about uh, against the goodness of God in Stephen's ministry. Because what was happening, signs, wonders, and miracles, the goodness of God being displayed, coming up among people, healing people, setting people free, encouraging people. That is the goodness of God that was being spread by Stephen in his ministry. It was the goodness of God coming forth into the people and into the area. And the devil hates the goodness of God. And so as a result, he again begins to bring accusations against him in order to shut him down. Now, it mentions here about the laws of Moses or the customs of Moses that they felt like Stephen was speaking against. And as I've studied, there's really three basic categories of law that was instituted uh, in the Bible, in in the Old Testament and carried into the New. First of all, you have the moral law. It's like the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not, uh, you know, uh, look at uh, uh, your neighbor, commit adultery. That, you know, those are the moral law. Jesus never broke the moral law. Never, ever. Now, the second category of law they have is the civil law. We have civil law today. That really relates to our culture. That relates to how we get along with one another and when accidents happen and things that we didn't intend and things that we intentionally intended. How are they dealt with? How is justice brought in those situations when people live together and things happen that sometimes they weren't intended, sometimes they were? Again, that's a whole system of civil law that was developed through Moses in order to deal with people uh, so that we didn't kill one another and, and that we begin to like one another. God designed it that way. But civil law can differ between cultures. It's a fact today. Civil law in the United States is different than it might be in France or it might be in an African nation or it might be somewhere in Asia. You have different kinds of laws that govern people civilly. And then the last category of law that was developed in the, uh, in the Old Testament, carried in the New, was ceremonial law. That was like you have to wash your hands before you eat. You can't eat grain when you walk through the, 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 uh, the, the, the field of wheat. Uh, you can't heal on the Sabbath because that's work. You can't have sinners and tax collectors over to your house because you get contaminated. You can't touch lepers to heal them because you will yourself be contaminated. Those are all ceremonial laws. And Jesus broke every one of them because they were laws of men. They weren't laws of God. And so Stephen is, again, he's bringing forth the fact of how Jesus changed everything. And they're so staunchly embedded in Jewish law and Moses' law, the customs of Moses, they can't see beyond The reality that, yes, moral law is always the same, never changes. We always uphold that. Civil law sometimes can change in the culture. Again, not right or wrong, just different. But ceremonial laws are laws of men. And it's just, they put burdens on us that shouldn't be. And so Stephen is preaching these things to try to get them to understand. And they're pushing back and saying he's teaching blasphemous truth. Because he's getting in and meddling with the very thing that they wanted to strap people's lives with to to be religious about it rather than to set them free to serve Jesus as he desires. Stephen never taught anything other than what Jesus taught. For instance, Jesus said he was greater than Moses. You find that in John 1.17. Jesus said he was God. You find that in John 10, 30. Jesus is greater than the temple. He pointed that out in Matthew 12, 6. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. Jesus said that about himself in Matthew 5, 17. And so Stephen is really not preaching anything other than what Jesus said. But it was a little bit different than what Moses said, even though Moses uh, uh, Moses was looking forward to Jesus. 
And we have this, 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 again, this whole clash of culture that is going on that's trying to be sorted out. And Stephen is fearlessly pointing out the truth. Then we have the next thing that happens is we have a turn in public opinion. It says, they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard, Stephen. Now, interestingly enough, that phrase, we have heard, that's secondary information, isn't it? In other words, they didn't hear it, but the the leaders put lies into some of the people, and they say, we have heard. You know what would happen today if that were in a court of law? It'd be thrown out as hearsay. It's hearsay. Because you didn't see it, you didn't hear it firsthand, it's hearsay. But however, in this case, that hearsay turned the public opinion. This is the first time public opinion turned. Previously, as we read, public opinion was on the side of the apostles. In fact, the Sanhedrin, they couldn't do anything because the public opinion was yay for what God was doing through the lives that were being changed and healings that were happening. Public opinion was on their side. Suddenly, public opinion has now turned. And now it's against Stephen and against the church. How do, you, how do you turn public opinion? You get credible people to lie. That's how it works. Even today, people that we think that we trust, all of a sudden we find out, wait a minute, they're lying. How did that happen? And public opinion begins to turn because we have people that we think are credible. In reality, they're lying. I don't need to... If I go in to give you examples, I'll just get into trouble. So let's just keep on rolling here. But they said, we have heard. Stephen is advocating, again, a customs change. But the fact is, now public opinion has turned. And they're putting Stephen on trial. So they set him in the seat of putting him on trial. And then suddenly something happens. His face begins to shine. Which I think is ironic because when Moses came off the mountain meeting with God, it says that his face shone so bright that the people were like, had to put on sunglasses. They were like, ah, well, your face is too bright. We can't look into you. And he had to put a scarf in front until it faded. And then when he go back in the presence of God, it would shine again. And it would go, ah, your face is too bright. Interestingly enough, Stephen had that same thing happen to him. His face started shining like that of an angel. And I I can imagine the Sanhedrin sitting there going, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. We're tampering with something supernatural. Not just some guy that's, you know, trying to toad his own horn of some truth that he thinks is right. And that's how it ends. And we step into next week in chapter 7 to get a glimpse of how it ended. And uh, it's going to be fascinating how it ends and who's involved in that. But we'll wait for that till next week. But what does it mean to, for uh, Stephen's face to be shining? I think it's simply this. I think that even in the midst of the pressure that he was facing, the accusations that were be being thrown He was in perfect peace. I think that's what it means. He was in perfect peace. He was being affirmed by the Father in heaven, by his face suddenly glowing in a supernatural way. He was just in perfect peace. So what do we learn from chapter 6 of of Acts? First of all, we learn this. We learn... That there's no problem that God can't solve. And if we're in a situation, or you find yourself in a situation like now, thinking that you're trapped, there's no way out, and there's no possibility of anything turning. You've just bought into a lie. But when you begin to take it up, and you begin to pray and ask God, How does this problem get solved? The moment that you start to sense some hope is the moment you're on the way to your breakthrough. That's the start of it. And if you can't find hope, you won't find the breakthrough. There's some of you here today, maybe watching online, that are right now at a place where you feel like, I have no hope. And I'll pray for you in a moment. 
that God will show you the lie you're believing and that he'll implant a truth of hope into you right now. Just break that this morning so you walk away with hope. The second thing we can learn from that, that no matter where or when or who is trying to pressure you to compromise, you can still have perfect peace. And there may be people in here this morning or maybe watching online that you're pressured to compromise. I don't know whether it's home or work or, 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 or what. You're, you're pressured to compromise some truth that you know is true, you know is God, but you're pressured to compromise. And God says you don't have to live in fear and anxiety. You can have perfect peace. Just like Stephen did. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that today, as we've looked into this chapter, you've given us something that is so usable for us right where we're at, God. Thank you for Holy Spirit that is able to take these events that happened in the beginning of your church getting started and letting us realize that applies to me today. I need hope in situations I feel trapped in. I need peace when I'm feeling pressured to cave in. I'm just going to pause on my prayer and just ask if you, if that's you right now, whether you feel hopeless with no hope or you feel pressured to compromise. I want to pray for you right now, so just stand up. If that's you, just stand up, and I'm going to pray for you. Okay? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, you see those standing. You know the situation. You also know their desire, and their desire is, their desire is to please you and honor you and all that they say and do. So, Father, I pray for those standing that have the situation where they feel trapped, where they feel like there's no way out, where they feel like everything is totally hopeless. I pray in Jesus' name that you would identify the lie that they are believing at this very moment that is causing them to be trapped. Identify the lie to them right now. Now, Father, I pray you release truth to them that would give them hope. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. And, Father, I pray for those that are in situations of being pressured to compromise of what they know is right, what they know is real, what they know is true. And I pray, Father, that your peace that your word says that we can't even comprehend. It passes all understanding. Your peace would just come over and flood them right now in Jesus' name, Lord. Prince of peace, come over them. Come over their mind. Come over their soul. Come over their body, Father. An incredible peace that they are right in the center of your will. Thank you, God, that you minister to us in ways that we can't imagine. And when you do, it's so good. And God, we thank you that you're with us. You've never left us. You're right there in the thick of what we're going through. You say in Psalm 46, 1, you are a very present help in time of trouble. Your present help in time of trouble. Thank you, God, that is all we have to do is turn our eyes towards you and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and love. Amen.